economics, the maritime Silk Road, the Bengal trade, uh, rural and urban dichotomies, just words that are out there. We go into this, but again, the maritime Silk Road is always something that's very popular to talk about because the, it's something that's sort of spectacular and is visible to see as something we play on in this, and Silk is a major product in this. But there's equally, I would stress again, the overland connection is here that is equally important in this. The overland trade, upstream, downstream networking, I do a lot of this because a lot of the region is based upon ports of trade and other sorts of things to the coast and working up and down those riverine systems that are here in the region, especially if you're the sea here. It's become much more complex, too, in the recent past because it used to be downstream, upstream. Now this is getting really complicated. Because we have now the lateral, which is the big on the beachhead that is here that we see. And the newest thing that is here is our seeing floating villages that are here of nomadic peoples that are off the coastline who are also are players in the system. So there's a lot of analysis, and again, using all the different resources from really 20 years ago that I'm really reconstructed because there are new ways of looking at this, and especially throwing in this issue of the lateral coastline and now the floating villages. They're all there, and we've ignored them in the past. And it really changes a lot of how we understand the society here. Knowledge networks, I've talked about those. I'm going to move fairly quickly. How much time do I have left here? Uh, how much? How much more time do you want? This the connectivity that goes across to the Vietnam coastline here, South Vietnam coastline. It goes up here, and then there's a waterfall that's there. You have to kind of dodge around. So you're going to go across to all those ports we see there on the central Vietnam coastline, or you can go up to Mekong and go into the northern part of Vietnam on this system too. But this is the connectivity that we see, and again, we're demonstrating this in terms of our new archaeological evidence here. This is the side light of the things I was doing in Cambodia just now. The hot spot that we have is now down here. Uh, Nong Pen is the capital that's down here, and what we have right now <laughs> interestingly, is an enclosed city that dates back to the Angkor Wai period. It's 10 miles wide. And it's a composite then of earthen activities that provide an outer base that is reinforced then by fired brick in the interior. This thing is very sophisticated. But it's very important to their agriculture because they get annual flooding. And just nature system is the flooding includes then a backwater or salt water that ruins the agriculture. So if they have this entire structure then of land that is there to protect them then from that annual flooding that is there, that makes them productive. Now Angkor Wai is important in this history of the region because they're a major ceramics point and other sort of thing in terms of cultural development. We're learning a lot more about the ecology than the presence that will go with this. This is an interesting use of documentation. This is a documentation of an annual fair that is here. And this will take place usually on a normal basis, once a year, sometimes twice a year this year. This is located in the border zone between Vietnam and South China that is here. If any of you remember your European history, the name Champagne Fair may come out of this because this is outside Paris. And in European history, this will take place usually on an annual, if not subcategory night. Uh, subcategorizing this. This is back in medieval times in France. And you have meeting at that fair every year, then the people from in from North Europe and Eastern Europe and Southern Europe they all come together in this kind of fair environment you see to do their exchanges. And that's what this is about. This is documentation I have that basically you have the same thing going on in this border zone between China and that which is south of it here. And what's important about this in the documentation is you have the big time dealers that are there that sit back and drink on the wayside and kind of again talk to each other and there's other things until the last week that is a fair. Then they've been sort of negotiating things on a different night level up until that time. And then suddenly they bang these, these final kind of um, enterprises in that last week. While the small traders are doing things on the pedigree all the way through. This is pretty sophisticated stuff that we're looking at at a really high level then, of economic transaction. Again, the documentation is here that we're looking back here as I notes in the 13th century and the type of things that are taking place here. We have what looks to be the same sort of pattern that is in the Bay of Bengal region right now. We have some evidence of this. We're looking for this in more detail, but this one we really have. 
is the documentation of how this trade works. Sir, you, you say that in 1225 there was tax on assessment of value? Oh, God. But, uh, I mean, look at the, what we have at the different levels here, the small traders and the rich merchants and all these things, and the different levels of hierarchy in the marketplace that are going on here. Take a look at the marketplaces in your region. And really what you see here is equally complex. Do you have a diagram and understand how this fits together? This is what I'm doing basically in this sort of critical trade. It's a matter of working with the documentation. And also you do industrial or other sort of marketing. Do you ever sit down and try to diagram out what you're doing? Oops. I talked about the transactions. These are the type of textiles we see, Indian textiles, Balinese textiles, and all these sort of things. What is really remarkable, a lot of the work that I am doing right now is all in textile trade or has been in the past. What is remarkable is that we have textiles from the 14th and 15th centuries that are still available to us in this period of time. And the ones that are really most available are of the Eastern Indonesian archipelagos, where these become heirloom textiles that are put away and very kept together. They have all sorts of magical powers that are addressed in them and stuff. But again, we have these textile and the textile trade is an important part of the ocean realm. I don't have a slide of this, but I've done a lot of work in Encore a lot among other places, and what we find in Encore a lot, in particular, is a replication of Chinese and Indian textiles at Encore a lot, which is done in stone here. But it shows the importance of these trading connections and how, as I just showed that road network, that road network isn't just isolating the Encore realm, but it actually is a player then in the sea trade and otherwise it goes with that. And the textiles are a prime example of that, you would see. Gunpowder. This is the 15th century. And this is the beginning of gunpowder warfare we're looking at in that period of time. Uh, the key in this case is not only the building men of new guns, and these are the early guns, they're small scale cannon that we're using here, but it also engages saltpeter and sulfur. The problem with this is that no one has both those ingredients. You need saltpeter, you need sulfur to have gunpowder, right? This is extremely important as the Chinese and Vietnamese the first to really use effective gunpowder weaponry. But in order to get these materials, they need to be active in this entire South China Sea realm in terms of trading connections. And as it spreads down to the south and the rest of them, this area, and up into the Bad you equally need to factor this in terms of again the necessity of trade because no one has both these ingredients in the process. Well, the kind of pay off of this, and these are things we've extracted then through um, archaeology analysis, recoveries, sea wrecks especially where you see these things. But you really find an ingredients going back through the Vietnamese and the Chinese records. But initially, the Chinese had these and they came down and they defeated Vietnam. The Vietnamese were, did one-upsmanship on this. They, they went back to the drawing board and made better guns. And they chased the Chinese out in this case. And again, the records of the 15th century report all these sort of things. And the Chinese were so embarrassed in this, they went back into the end and developed their technology beyond this in terms of the future here. But this is an end product of the Indian Ocean Trade as you see. The gunpowder technology and all that comes out of that. These are our shipwreck recoveries that we have in terms of general things. We have makeup, we have tin and like coins, bangle bracelets, ship weights, glass beads. Ceramics is a big thing here, but you have this diversity of what we're bringing up from the shipwrecks. Just again, some background, this is Bagan, as we look at this, and I mentioned that. And this is Sri Kshetra, which is down in the southern part of Myanmar. This is also a place, interestingly, that has these 10 mile uh, radius uh, urban centers that we're looking at there as well. Um, it's still active today, back to Bagan, which is important in terms of the Theravada networking. Stories, this is what we find in a lot of the Myanmar period, Bagan, Bagal, Pegu period thereafter. A lot of this iconographic type of stuff that you see in these temples that are really textual sources that we have that are very valuable and again give us a dating base in these and how they are interpreted in local ways. 
the Thai temples to this period are similar in terms of their representations. I mentioned earlier the mandatory reordinations. Again, this is for this all links together in terms of the overlap between the communication by sea and that on land that we're seeing here. Borbadur, these are early sh ships that we see that are the wrecking and otherwise. Uh, they have these double outrigger canoes on the outside edge and then it becomes more complicated after this point in time. As these are examples then of new shipping that is taking place out in the oceans. There's Zheng He, stress in this case, Chinese again out there to promote a fluidity as opposed to that of military imposition. This is where we stand in this today here. I talked earlier about upstream downstream networking and this is what we look at in this case, the different levels then of the offshore, the shoreline and moving into these interiors. What is important about this is the communication and is bounded then by these mountain areas that we see here. And it's much more difficult to go over the mountains and it's easier to go up and down these things. So you have these petty monarchies and ports of trade that are in these systems then. And again, a multiplicity of these things. In order to control them, most of what you do is control the ports in terms of the issues of power empowerment. This is an example. This is a project that I've just come and kind of pleaded in which I'm looking at the Samudra Pasai port of trade that has, it's in this one of these areas then with these multiple river system type of patterns. And what we see is this complexity of, of the contacts that go with this. More kind of detailed flow basically here in some flow charts. Um, moving from foreign trade and all the kind of extensions then of what we see in the relationships that will derive out of this. Moving on this side, local movements, religious reform, increased literacy that we see, ethnic cultural homogenization that we, homogenization that we see, uh, territorial integration, administrative centralization, regional and sub-regional commercial networking, and enhanced warfare. I talk about all these in some way or other today. But all together and functionally operate then as a region then in different ways of support. Um, and again, looking at issues of shared culture, flows of people, somewhat commodity specializations that are here, but finding common historical bases from which to operate as we would. And again, I do use the example of religion that stands out a lot in terms of some of the things we're doing in terms of our historical analysis of, again, the, the Bay of Bengal region, uh, commodity flows that we see in terms of the technologies, the commodities that are being passed from place to place, and also people movement. And I did use the example of the Chulias, the people from South India in particular, who really do spread out along the line and are a counter then to what will take place thereafter of Chinese diaspora moving into the Malay tin mines and just all sorts of other things that are there. But then the opposite of that, where you have so many numbers of South Asians and from people from the Bay Bengal region moving in then to the rubber plantations will come out of this too that we see. But I'm going back to a period of time that is really pre-colonial if you want to look at that and looking at a system that is very functional at that period of time as more or less an equity system as opposed to that of hierarchical as we might look at that. But once again, I think there's some things that we have in terms of our new historiographies that provide a lot of opportunity and looking at different ways of promoting then the idea of the integrity of the region that will go with this. And equally in this case, I think the archeological does add itself in terms of the material evidence that is here, as well as some of the written records as I showed you today as well. It's a matter of putting these things together, but using this past to your advantage as opposed to seeing it as a a relic of a past age gone by here. Is that adequate, or do you want to follow up? Okay. Uh, Mr. Manoj, Minister Commerce. Actually, I thank uh, very much, uh, respected Professor Mr. Hong, for why I thank so much having the comments. Okay. <laughs> actually, from the 1500, actually, uh, there was an integrated economy in this area. And actually, the uh, factor of production, products, etc. The capital workers are moving really mm -hmm. in this thing. And uh, even if you think that the diaspora actually that was moving even for the employment mm -hmm. in mining, professional rates, mm -hmm. the Malaysians again. And uh, there was a movement in the factors that uh, actually uh, that was um, altered to some extent uh, 
I think actually in the aggression from the West, the Dutch, mm -hmm. and the Portuguese, and the rest of the English. Right. And that actually, Bonita Mangondo, Dagadilo Razundo, Pohani Shogu, actually the instrument of trade was somewhat to Part of the society it was an actual uh, uh, subsistence economy, but in the broader area there was trade. But the last point was the partition of India. Uh, and that's why during actually lecture is important to me that as I'm working with the government in promoting the policy of the government in trade, that will give me an insight knowledge how to shape the actually, trade policy of the government mm -hmm. in the near future. And not actually uh, uh, government keeping the, the union only, mm -hmm. but rather we have, what we get are mm -hmm. And uh, I hope uh, actually that the base that will also be actually in the future in the in the Gulf areas and also in the in southern areas. And uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Let me just comment briefly on one thing you hit on that I think is important. And that is you're addressing the fact that South Asia diaspora who are living around the world, this is important to them too because it provides them a history as a people then equally in a Western society setting that is here. But again, that idea of identity and having a, a strength of identity that is very positive as opposed to negative, as opposed to being labor on a, a tin plantation or a tin mining operation or work on a rubber plantation. Again, you have this really strong heritage that is there of accomplishment. And in many ways, I think South Asia, as also Southeast Asia is doing then, is cultivating that identity of the past and it's interesting, you know, again, your comment of how this is important then to people of the diaspora who are living in overseas and the settings that go with this in time. But thank you for contributing that. Yeah. Okay. I have a few sure. Brief questions. Number one is the time period that you concentrated on, uh, 1,000 to 1,500. Yes. And also the area that you talked about. Mm -hmm. In this period, three major civilizations were interacting in this region. Yes. The Muslim Arabic civilization, mm -hmm. the Indian civilization, and the Chinese civilization. Yes. And that is what we see when you, the way you explain things, that the interaction of these civilizations. But one thing was not very clear to me yeah. about the timing of the movement of these various civilizations in different directions. Because I understand that the Muslim Arabic uh, uh, business people moved to China even in the sixth, uh, seventh century. Mm -hmm. And uh, the early yes. uh, arrivals were in uh, Fujian. Yes. And uh, you talked about Admiral Chengke, but much before that, we had uh, the Chinese and the Arabs coming in. Yes. So I would like to know a little bit more about <laughs> uh, these uh, Arabs. Did they stop coming, or they continued to come since then? And uh, number two is about monetization. You mentioned about the Roman uh, uh, monetary Right. Uh, uh, um, I mean money and the Myanmar money, but I thought Arabic and Indian money was also very really equally uh, prominent, also Ch Chinese money. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did not mention anything about this, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Number three is, uh, I think, uh, a very small one. You've been talking about coconut plantations all around, but uh, if, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, the plantation that we have mostly in Malaysia today is oil palm. That's the point, actually, of that transition well, to that. Thank you. Okay. Compared with what we know about early Indic civilization that is out in places like Akio and other regions going up to, well, in the Vietnamese coastline, especially here and parts of Sumatra and Java that are here, there is an ambiguity of who those people are and what they do. They're, they are there that we know, and we do have the records of them being there. We just don't have the overall details that we're here with that. Now, as we deal with the Islamic populations in China, this becomes complex because some of them are coming by sea. But you also have a good deal of overland transit that is coming in over the Silk Road then into China. And most of the contact in terms of Muslim population in China is going to come out of that, that overland connection that is there. And one of the reasons I stress that is that from the Middle East, it's a lot easier trip, let's say, to go overland in many of these ways as opposed to doing the sea route that, will, that is a little more complex. 
Having said that, there is, though, the other argument that can be made that with the monsoon travel, sometimes it's easier to go by a sea in this too. But again, the problem is before about 1,000, most of this is a segmented trip that you're taking from the Middle East, which is largely going to go no further than South Asia. And they will, at that point, some will go on, but most of this is being carried on beyond that point by people that are following the monsoons in different patterns. And a lot of this has to do with the monsoon travel and seasonality. You can't make this trip in one year that is here. It's rather segmented. So again, the Middle Easterners initially are very active on the West Indian coastline, but don't go very much further than that. What I showed you with the Yemeni connection, however, is the beginning of this transit now as you have new settlements that are going on largely above uh, Sri Lanka on the coastline, and then beginning to move out further into Southeast Asia into Aceh and areas like that, where we really do have an example then of something that becomes more permanent. The records we have of the Yemeni uh, largely focuses upon the sermon, where often in the sermon you acknowledge as a part of that sermon the patron who is helping to support this sermon. I forget the name of what that is off the top. But this becomes important, but what is important about that is that we have the recording then of the sermons that are done for these periods of time under the Yemeni uh, dynastic sponsorship. And we use these then as a source then of again seeing the linkage to the Yemeni monarchy to this as well as dating this entire process. But this is sort of a new source material that we have on this and very unique that follows its way then into a place like Aceh and other places in the Indonesian archipelago. I'm less... I do not have a sense of this as much as we look at the northern Bay of Bengal region that is here, because most of it is going to go up to, to about the middle zone that is the uh, east coast of India, where you do see the Chulia and other groups that are active, Muslim groups that are there, uh, arguably then coming from the north down, but equally possibly in this case that linkage to the sea that results in these people converting to Islam and the things will derive from that. So that's kind of where I go with the Muslim evidence that is here. Um, second one you had was coinage. Okay. Um, coinage becomes, there's Chinese coinage, and you basically have the core of Chinese coinage you will find at most of the sites because it's universally here. Um, it's copper coinage, basically, that you have coming out of China, and it is universally available. You will, in an earlier period of time, though, in addition to the Chinese, find different types of Middle Eastern coinage in the sites. Akio is the place that has most of these. The Myanmar coinage is an important part of this. Uh, early Tamil coinage from South India is a part of this too. I have written on this and I do have an article if you're interested just I'll, I'll pass it your way here. But I did an analysis basically largely looking at the Akio sites as a source then of this intermixture then of coinage systems that are here and other things that will kind of drive with this. But what you do see is the use of coinage in different types of transactions as opposed to that of then physical transactive that's an important part of this too that we see coming out of this. Um, we find in later periods of time, as we look at the shipwrecks, things get more complicated here where you have a lot of coinage that's going back and forth on these ships, but also then gold bars and silver bars and otherwise that are part of this that are intended then for larger scale type of transactive activities and they have stampages on them then as a part of this transactive system that you see taking effect here. But just a whole versatility of this, but the fact that you have these different denominations of coinage is a pretty good indicator then of the type of trade that's going on that's much more complicated than what we give it credit for and where the coinage is an awfully good indicator of this process that we'd see. Uh, thirdly, in terms of the uh, you actually, I correct, you correct me on this, but again, coconut palm in a sense, they're oil palms, but I, I think of them as coconut palms, I guess in the same category that is here, but you're right, they're oil palms in this, as you see that transition. Point being in this case, um, where Malaysia's already gone through a lot of that transformative, and how you find then the urban centers of Malaysia in a difficult position, having then transplanted South Asian diaspora, we're trying then to live, work into the construction industries, other things in various ways, uh, coming into more of a situation in which they are changing their entire lifestyle and the complexities of doing this and fitting this into an environment in Malaysia that is also complex in terms of different divisions of Islam that are part of that society too. 
but again, the South Asia community and diaspora community in the case of Malaysia is part of a complexity of address that is an important part of Malaysia's redefining themselves in the present term. But again, with lots of linkage to the region that we're looking at here. addressing in this is equally not fully fitting the way that they should. And to be specific in this case, Indonesia is a problem for them here. And that Indonesia says they're going to do things but then doesn't back up their words with doing here. And the best example of this is how Indonesia is addressing the issue of the smog and everything which is very much a part of Singapore life as well as the entire region, and saying, oh, we're going to res resolve this, and yes, the, the people responsible for this are being punished in certain ways, or again, we're intervening in this, but yet the backside of this is that the government is very linked then to the corporations who are doing this, and ultimately, somewhere that that connection and the military's engagement in that very specifically that we see makes this a very complex issue to resolve, and in their context then becomes an issue then of stability of government that is derived from this, where going in a different direction means that they're going to have to address issues of Islamic divisions and some other things that they don't really want to then see exacerbated in the process of this. So this gets pretty complex. As I know, your region is equally at this level of complexity of just different levels, but there's not a simple answer to these type of questions, and it, but it takes a while to get there. But let me also note that in the context of ASEAN, They've been at it for a while right now and are finally reaching some degree of resolution and are, I admire them for how they've dealt with this in the aftermath of the Vietnam War period of time and other sort of regional problems, but beginning to kind of override those things in different ways. A lot of this is part of the issue then of and how some places such as Vietnam have done a pretty good job then of making these resolutions in other parts of ASEAN too with probably Laos and Indonesia is the problem children 